Today I'm going to talk to you about rhetoric. Now, it could be that you don't even know what the word means, in which case watch on, dear viewer, because I'm going to tell you all about it in this video which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More of them later. Now, I think a lot of modern people have got the impression that rhetorical means, oh, unimportant, oh, just ignore that, it was just a rhetorical question, oh, I just said that for rhetorical effect. But actually, I'm going to argue in this video, rhetoric, you see, is very important. I am trying to persuade you of something using rhetoric because that's what rhetoric is. It is the art, the craft, some might even hesitantly say the science of persuasion. And it, it's something that all people are doing all the time to some degree. Right now I'm doing it. I'm using rhetoric on you. I'm using gesture and voice tone and, and other such things to persuade you that it's worth watching the rest of this video because it's going to be great. It's going to be interesting or informative or funny or something. I'm trying to persuade you of my credibility and the future that you could enjoy if only you watched this video. But perhaps it'll be rubbish. You don't know, but you've got my rhetoric to judge it on. So how am I doing so far? Well, I, I, I don't know. I'll find out later. But if all speech is to some degree rhetoric, then that makes rhetoric really very important. So it should be something of which we should be very aware and perhaps we should be educated in. But today there are no classes in rhetoric in schools, but perhaps there should be. I mean, there were, there were right the way from uh, the ancient Greeks, right the way up to the 19th century. It was a major pillar of Western education. And yet today it's somewhat neglected and, and perhaps it's time we became more aware of it and we taught it formally in schools, I'm going to argue. Now, the idea of how to uh, win friends and influence people goes back a long, long way. Uh, the ancient Mesopotamians wrote of it thousands of years BC, um, and the ancient Egyptians got into it quite a, quite, quite a lot too, as did uh, Confucius. He wrote on, obviously he didn't use the word rhetoric, um, he was writing in 6th century BC China, but he touches on the idea, ways of persuading people. Um, Confucius is a tremendously overrated guy. Um, uh, he had There were loads of other scholars uh, of his day and before who were much more highly rated and revered, but uh, all their works got destroyed and just by uh, by luck uh, some copies of Confucius's work survived uh, hidden away in a building somewhere. But anyway, um, he's possibly a little bit overrated, but what the hell? He's, he's, he's what the Chinese have got today, so revere, revere away. Um, and uh, if you went to university, for example, in the Middle Ages, uh, you would, if you were doing uh, the, the liberal arts, you would study the trivium or trivium of grammar, logic, and yes, you guessed it, rhetoric. It was considered one of the main things that should be taught to people. Uh, so today we have geography and history. Apparently a lot of people in Canada and the USA at school don't have geography and history classes as standard. But anyway, in Britain we have maths and physics and chemistry and biology and art and music and geography and history but no rhetoric. Um, so how did rhetoric as we know it today get going? Well, it was with the ancient Greeks and the chap who's most often credited with having codified it and generally made it a recognizable study, field of study is Aristotle. And he came up with all sorts of categorizations. Uh, for example, the modes of persuasion. Uh, the three main, there are others, but the three main ones being uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, he also categorized uh, not just the, the methods of persuasion, but also the categories of the purpose. For instance, are you doing this for law? Are you doing this for politics? Are you doing this for seduction? Um, and so he would come up with the different techniques for all the various different categories. But the three biggies are ethos and pathos, which of course are now modern English words, but don't have quite the same meaning, and logos. Now ethos is, uh, it's a strange word, it has two meanings really. Uh, it refers to the authority of the speaker. So I might say to you, you should listen to me because I have this qualification from the University of Greatness and you shouldn't listen to him, he's rubbish. I mean, he's got, he, he did a correspondence course from the University of Ambridge and look at the jacket he's wearing, he's rubbish, you can't believe him. Believe me, I am credible because I got qualifications and everything. Look, certificates, they're not certificates, but imagine certificates on my wall. So uh, you, you might believe me because of, of my, my having argued my ethos. Um, another thing about ethos, uh, which is of course uh, related to the word ethics, is uh, a shared value that we might have. I mean, we all want knowledge, don't we? We all want knowledge. We have that shared value. So if you want knowledge, naturally you're going to want to carry on watching this video. You see, that was that was a, a an, an ethos related argument, a bit of a bit of rhetoric there in order to get you to watch more of this video. Uh, so please do that. Um, and uh, please, you see, what was that? That was pathos, you see. As desperate, please watch my video. Pity me, but actually pathos, from which we get the uh, the modern English word pathetic, isn't just an appeal to your pity, it's actually an appeal to any of your emotions. So I might use pathos to appeal to your anger 
or your fear. Watch this video or something terrible will happen. Um, or your, your wishful thinking. Uh, do you want some chocolate? Oh, well, you know, we all love chocolate, don't we? Mmm, chocolate. Just want to imagine the, the smell and the taste of chocolate. It's great, isn't it? And there'll be more of that if you watch more of this video. I'm appealing to your emotions. That is pathos. And logos, uh, which is related to the modern English word logic, uh, is to do with the facts and the figures and so forth, but not necessarily good and true facts and figures. I might use logos, I might use statistics to bamboozle you, I might blind you with science and, and apparent logic. Um, so logos is a, a, a means of persuasion, it's not actual truth itself. Uh, the Romans were also quite into their uh, into their rhetoric, and probably the two biggest are Quintilian and Cicero. Uh, yes, uh, for those of you who've watched Rome, yeah, yeah, that that's Cicero. That's yeah, that's the guy who. Uh, yes, he did actually get murdered. It was true that two guys did actually turn up to his villa and and and, and kill him to death. But it wasn't Verinus and Pullo. It was two other guys, and we know their names and who they were in their ranks and so forth. But so the Rome was playing a bit fast and loose with the truth there. But then never mind. In fact, a bit of a digression. Anyway, yes, that's Cicero. Um, so he was uh, writing around the time of Julius Caesar, uh, and they came up with again another load of categorizations of 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 aspects that could be studied. Um, there are the the canons, for instance, of rhetoric. Sometimes it's the five canons, but sometimes it's the six canons. But but anyway, uh, the five which I can be bothered to mention right now are the invention. So first you've got to come up with your ideas. So how am I going to argue this case? How am I going to persuade people? Maybe if I could I could use this tactic. So first you've got to decide how you're going to do it. Then there's the arrangement. You've got to arrange your argument for maximum effect. And that's a bit like planning an essay, isn't it? If you're writing a, a history essay for school, a lot of uh, academic topics, uh, at least in Britain, are taught through the medium of writing essays about them, in which you are invited to argue a case. So it might say, um, it was a shortage of money that led to the king's defeat in the English Civil War. Discuss! And so you then have to put a case. You have to decide whether it was or wasn't a shortage of, of money that led for that, and then you have to present a case. Perhaps I shouldn't have picked that particular example. That's actually a real example uh, from uh, from my school days. I remember that, and I didn't get a very good mark for that essay. I remember because I I used the um, rhetorical uh, device of saying, "Well, let's imagine, let's, let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that the king had an infinite amount of money. So would he then have won the war? Well, yes, he would, because he would have been able to bribe people, bribe his way into towns, hire any number of mercenaries from abroad, and he could have paid a huge army and bought all the best equipment and 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 so forth. So yeah, give him an infinite amount of uh, of money, the king will have would have won the English Civil War. So I, my teacher wasn't impressed by that rhetorical device. But anyway, you know, I tried and I failed. Um, so uh, if you're writing an essay, you want to arrange an argument, you want to decide, well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up with this and then this argument, and then I'm going to deal with counter-arguments, which they, they have people that might say, but surely if, um, but then, then right near the end, I'm going to hit them with my big surprise argument, and that's the best order that's to arrange my various uh, arguments in. So there's the arrangement which is like, as I say, planning an essay, so it's a useful thing to know. Um, then you've got uh, the style. What sort of style are you going to use? Uh, should it be appropriate to the content? Well, uh, you might say that, for instance, if you're uh, trying to persuade someone of the best way to make a flan, keep it simple. Just say, do this, then do that, mix so much flour, and add this egg, and, and gas temperature, whatever, and, and you, you, the instructions for writing a, a flan, probably you're not going to convince them that yours is the best recipe for a flan if you start with the ending and then do a flashback to the beginning. Remember the time when you were mixing the or sieving the flour and so forth? No, just, just keep it plain. And if you're trying to persuade someone of um, your political views and that everyone should believe that you are the candidate for the job or whatever, you might want to you know, just start getting a bit more persuasive and start using a bit more of your logos and ethos. Uh, but you know, don't don't overdo the style. But if you're trying to seduce an individual, then hey, you might say the gloves are off, be as flowery as you like, quote poetry to your heart's content. Uh, so there's matching the style to the the, the, the function, if you like. Uh, there's also memory, which used to be uh, taught in schools, mnemonics, which is the the, the craft, the, the the techniques of remembering stuff, which used to be taught uh, a standard in loads of schools and isn't anymore. Um, there's a very good book by Darren Brown, which is just over there somewhere. I'll, I'll show you it. Hang on. Got it. Yep, this is it. Darren Brown, The Tricks of the Mind. I rather like this. And uh, he talks quite a lot about mnemonics. And I tried out his, his various techniques and, you know, I found that they work. You know, I memorised all the cards in the pack of cards. Uh, and then dealt out face up, one at a time. They were, they were shuffled, looking at them. 
Um, and until I had just three cards in my hand, and then I had to say, right, what were the three cards have I got, have I got left? And, you know, I actually got it almost right first time. So it works. Yeah. Uh, he also talks uh, about rhetoric to some degree. Um, and Darren Brown, by the way, is um, very famous in Britain, but I don't think he's uh, very famous outside Britain as uh, a showman who uh, uses tricks of the mind to, to fool people into doing what he wants. Uh, and uh, it, it's not magic, it's not a conjurer. He, well, he does a bit of conjuring, but it, it's, um, yes, it's all psychological tricks. It, it, he's very entertaining. Anyway, um, yes, he talks about rhetorical uh, ways of holding an audience's attention, for instance. Uh, he says that uh, he, sometimes he's in a theatre doing a live show and he can start hearing people fidgeting more and more in the audience and, and the phones are going off and he can hear rustling crisp packets and he thinks, I'm losing them. I'm losing this audience. What do I do? So the natural inclination is to go big and to go loud and start waving your arms around more and, and, and speak really fast. No, 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 listen to me, listen to me, pay attention to me. I've got stuff that's interesting to say. Please, please, please. No, that's not what he does. He goes quiet. And everyone then thinks, oh, Something's changed. I better listen. And the rustling stops. And then... He pauses a long time as though he's actually thinking about what he's going to do next. And maybe he's not going to do the thing he was earlier planning to do. But maybe he'll do something different instead. And the whole audience is then thinking, oh, things have, things have changed. What's he going to do next? And then the rustling has gone completely. It's silent. And he knows. I've got them back. And then he can go back to his act. And now the next thing takes on more influence, uh, has more of a rhetorical effect in that it has more influence over the audience because now they're really listening to him. And he can go on to the next thing. And then he can go back to the act. And he's got the, he's got the audience back in the palm of his hand. It's a rhetorical technique, which is useful to know about. Um, and now today, if you want to work in law or lobbying or politics or advertising or marketing or something like that, it's really obvious that uh, a good grounding in rhetoric is, is, is going to be pretty handy. But I would say that it's everyone is using rhetoric. Uh, an author, when J.R.R. Tolkien is, is penning The Lord of the Rings, he's got to persuade you, he's got to convince you that uh, this Legolas guy or this... Um, uh, this hobbit chap, they actually have feelings and that uh, how they're feeling uh, actually matters and that this ring really does need to be destroyed and the way to do it is drop into a volcano that doesn't even exist. He's got to persuade you that this world is actually at least a potentially real world and that there's something is genuinely at stake. He's at stake. He's got to persuade you of all that using rhetoric. And uh, so authors are using it all the time. Um, job seekers, of course, uh, trying to get a pass a job interview are using rhetoric. And there are books today on how to pass job interviews, which you could say are actually just very specialist uh, rhetoric books. Um, but even a plumber needs rhetoric. A plumber has to convince you that he's the guy to hire to do the job, that yes, he knows what he's doing and he's not going to flood your cellar. So um, everyone I said this before and I said it again, everyone is using rhetoric, so it's really important. Um, and you might say that, well, no, no, surely scientists are above rhetoric. Scientists don't use rhetoric. Oh, no, no, no. Scientists use rhetoric all the time. Uh, for a start, if you are a scientist, you have to apply for funding and you've got to persuade someone that you're the person to give the money to because you're not just going to spend it all on sweets and comics and that you know what you're doing and that actually what you're studying is important and that you're very likely to come up with good results. You've got to persuade people of all that. And even when you've done the science, you've got to then publish the science and persuade people that you did the science properly and that these results actually mean something, even though you cobble it together on the night before. But never mind. You've got to be persuasive, even as a scientist. And in fact, science itself, the modern scientific method, is to some degree a product of rhetoric because people like Francis, Bra ba Francis Bacon and John Locke in the 17th century, they were uh, people who were very concerned with rhetoric and they used rhetoric and the study of it to, to further science by using rhetoric as a device to move towards truth. Because you can say, right, I will construct an argument if the moon is actually orbiting the earth then, and you can construct an argument based on that as a, as a premise, and then someone else can say, but surely then the moon would be like this. And you can, ha you can argue it out using rhetoric, using logos uh, and other techniques. And uh, by this means, you can actually get closer to the truth. Um, you could say that lawyers are using rhetoric in court in order to get to the truth of what actually happened, or whether this person is really guilty or innocent. Um, so 
uh, science, it, it actually the scientific method was developed partly along those lines in the Age of Enlightenment. So um, yes, rhetoric is actually a fundamental part of science. Um, now, uh, there was uh, a group called the Sophists. They got going, I think, around 600 BC or something like that in uh, ancient Greece. And um, a particularly uh, famous example being Gorgias, Georgie boy. Um, and they were sort of itinerant scholars who went around Greece uh, teaching people, teaching men, uh, how to use rhetoric. And uh, they were, they, they were, they were well paid, they were, were successful, they were, but not everyone entirely agreed with what they were doing. And sometimes um, when I read about them, they put me in mind of pickup artists or pickup artist gurus, the sort of guys who teach other guys how to pick up women in bars, uh, because a sophist would teach you uh, supposedly how to become a better person in every way, but actually they could also teach you some rather empty arguments. They could come up with a, a clever, clever way of winning the argument, winning the political debate, uh, winning the law case, whatever it is, because you were so clever and you, you couched your argument so cleverly that you completely flummoxed the opposition and you won the day despite perhaps not actually having truth on your side. Um, uh, it, it's a bit like the pickup artist who, who perhaps gets very good at uh, persuading women to jump into bed with him, but perhaps he hasn't actually become someone worth jumping into bed with. Um, and uh, Plato uh, uh, crit uh, criticised uh, sophists of sophistry, this, this, uh, this empty, clever argument uh, style that they would come up with. And uh, he had a bit of a bee in his bonnet, though, because his uh, good friend and mentor, uh, Socrates, who was particularly missed, uh, was put on trial and executed despite having been defended by sophists. So they failed to save the life of, of, of his friend and mentor. So he had a bit of a, bit of a bee in his bonnet and, and wasn't shy about writing it, uh, was, was old Plato. Um, but anyway, uh, the importance of uh, rhetoric in certain societies has gone up and down and some historians have suggested that this is to do with who's in charge because uh, if uh, all the top patricians of the day meet in a senate and all debate using oratory and that's how you, you win the day uh, then rhetoric is extremely important and if that's how court cases are done then again rhetoric really really important. Uh, the ancient Athenians realised that uh, rhetoric was so useful for winning a court case that they actually banned lawyers um, because you know the rich guy would be accused by the poor guy and then the rich guy would hire a really good lawyer the lawyer would then make an amazing speech and get him off despite the fact that hang on wasn't he guilty um, so they banned lawyers so what happened next yeah you, you know what happened don't you the same thing happened again rich guy gets accused by a poor guy the rich guy then goes to the trial and makes an amazing speech that was written for him by a professional speech writer who used to be a lawyer. Yeah, so yeah, you can't win. But anyway, um, uh, the, uh, the, so as the emperors took over, the emperors were just telling everyone what to do, and so the, the debate in the Senate became not nearly so important, um, and therefore other forms of rhetoric like letter writing and poetry actually uh, became the, the focus for, for uh, uh, the study of rhetoric. Um, and uh, St. Augustine, actually, well, just while I think of him, uh, St. Augustine, um, he uh, converted from paganism, having been educated in rhetoric, to Christianity, and then found himself uh, well, using this pagan art of, of rhetoric to persuade people to become Christians. And uh, he got into a bit of trouble with some people for that. And there was actually something of a debate, uh, uh, particularly the, the, between the Protestants and the Catholics, who had different ideas about what rhetoric was all about and what techniques were okay. Although, do you know what? Whatever it is, if you're up in a pulpit using fire and brimstone to persuade people that there is a hell and that they better do exactly what you say, otherwise they're going to go there, that's rhetoric. That's, a, that's, a, that's pathos, isn't it? That's an appeal to fear. Um, so you can't actually stamp out rhetoric, although various people have over the years disapproved of it, you can't actually stamp it out because it's it's so ingrained in what humans do when they communicate with each other and you're not going to stop people communicating with each other. Um, now in England in the age of, uh, of enlightenment pamphleteering became all the rage and in the uh, 18th and 19th century it really took off and it was part of um, a movement which was also um, bound up with uh, the role of the king becoming lesser and the role of parliament becoming greater and the common man, well at least the educated landowning common man uh, who had the vote becoming politically engaged and suddenly there was political discourse and pamphleteering you know, could actually get things done and influence people, powerful people in the position to do something and 
rhetoric again was taught uh, as a standard uh, subject in schools and uh, became part of freedom of speech. You see, I am British, uh, which means that I enjoy a certain amount of freedom of speech, and that's largely because of the rhetoric uh, of those those uh, pamphleteers of the uh, the eighteenth century who realized that freedom of speech was absolutely fundamental to rhetoric being able to do what it can do uh, to its uh, fullest course. And so that became these ideas became bound together. And so uh, with the mother of parliaments and so forth, uh, the, the the rights of man, I can say almost whatever I like in Britain. Okay, not everything. You know, I'm not supposed to shout fire in a theatre, for instance, and there's still a, a law against slander, so I have to be careful what I say about individuals, and I'm not supposed to pass on military secrets to the French, but I can say almost whatever I want in this country, thanks to uh, those scholars of rhetoric back then. So, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, I do appreciate it. Freedom of speech is great. Now, if um, you're into knowledge and so forth, which you are, of course, uh, because I remember you, you were discerning and uh, do you remember strikingly handsome? That was flattery, by the way. It's an appeal to an emotion. Um, you might be interested in The Great Courses Plus. Yes, it's more rhetoric from me. And um, they have a, a, a course that's all about this sort of thing, about uh, uh, argumentation and, 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 and rhetoric and so forth. And it's um, I haven't explained what The Great Courses Plus is. It's a website and you can go there and they've got thousands of hours, far more than you're ever going to watch, of um, lectures by top university professors from around the world, although mostly American, and um, they uh, talk to you about, usually for about half an hour as a lump, uh, in courses of typically about 24 lectures. Uh, the, particular course I'm featuring is a 24 uh, hour, that's 12 hours, 24 times, 24 times half an hour, 12 whole hours of, of, of this sort of stuff that you can hear. And wait a minute, but maybe you don't trust the, the, the credentials of, the, of the, uh, the lecturer. Well, let's do a quick bit of ethos, uh, shall we? Because we've done the shared value thing, or that was ethos about, we, we all like knowledge, don't we? Well, let's, let's uh, hear a little bit about this chap. Dr. Zarevsky is the Owen L. Kuhn Professor of Communication Studies at Northwestern University, uh -huh. where he has taught for over 30 years. A nationally recognized authority on rhetoric and a widely published author. So there you go. Uh, so that, that, there's, there's the ethos covered. So uh, n naturally, I think you now believe that you know this guy is qualified. And um, what else? We could well, we could go to pathos. You know, we, we could we could say that you know you too could persuade people and become powerful and mighty. Ah, yes, that I'm appealing to your vanity now. You see, so that, that there's pathos, or I, I could say that. Uh, oh wow! Look how beige that suit is. And uh, oh, but a little bit of logos. I mean, we need to know a little bit uh, more about this chap. Does he have a good scholar's cradle? Okay, fair enough. To be honest, I've seen better, but that's good enough. Okay, so he's got the scholar's cradle. Uh, he's got the beige suit. He's got the qualifications. It looks like he's got the whole lot. So uh, this is something you can do. So you can do it for free. This is more logos because I'm telling you information here now. You can watch this whole course and others for free for a whole month. Uh, all you have to do is go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige. Type that in and you can go there or this is much easier. You can just click on the link in the description below and you will then get a one month free trial. And maybe I should put in a bit more pathos here. A great thing about it is that Unlike, do you remember school? Do you remember how down you felt at school? Because everything you learned, you realised you were going to be tested on later. There are no tests! It's great. It's like school. It's like all the knowledge with no exam at the end of it. So no, none of that, oh, I'm going to have to learn it all. None of that. Just joy! There you go. More pathos. So, um, that's the Great Courses Plus. Why don't you give it a look? I would. Anyway. Um, uh, I'm looking at my notes here, which I'll pin to the side of the uh, camera. Ah, right. Yes, I remember what I was going to talk about next. So today, what should we do today? Um, there is this tradition, there is this uh, tradition that's been lost, and there is this very important topic that's not being taught anymore. And I suggest that it could be taught in schools. It could be written into the national curriculum. Now, I know if you're a teacher in Britain, you may be thinking, oh, goodness, not something else. 
added to the national curriculum. I've got enough on my plate already. But I don't see why this should be dumped onto the timetable as a new topic, uh, which they're going to require new teachers to teach. Uh, I think this could be parceled out amongst all the topics, you know, fairly, fairly and evenly. So uh, in Britain, for instance, on the, uh, the national curriculum of things that all schools are supposed to teach, there is dance. And this tends to get dumped on the poor PE teacher because no one else knows anything about dance. And PE, that's sort of jumping about, isn't it? There you go, PE teacher, you teach dance. Uh, I know this because when I was a dance teacher, I used to get hired by <laughs> a hapless, please help me out here, um, PE teachers, and I would go in and teach the Charleston or something. But anyway, um, and I know that some English teachers are going to thinking they're going to dump it on us. I know, I know. But it doesn't have to be all dumped on you because all that the history, the history teachers can talk about constructing an essay, constructing an argument, and uh, appeals used in the past for persuading people. The history of it, and and how you can appeal to an examiner reading your essay that you know this is a great argument and that he should give you a really good mark for this essay. Yep. So the history people can talk about it. The geography people can talk about it. It, it, it you can use it across the board. You could. Maths, for instance, maths does yes. It's vital that people get taught about uh, the use of, of statistics and how you can interpret other people's bad statistics and see through it, so you don't get bamboozled. And that's perhaps the main point I've got here. The main reason I think that rhetoric should be taught today it's to immunise us against the terrible standard of rhetoric that one that one frequently encounters. Now I'm not going to say that there was any golden age in the past when all rhetoric was just great. I'm sure there never was. But I have been struck recently by how terrible a lot of modern rhetoric is. In the political scene uh, in Britain recently we've had a vote on whether to leave or stay in the EU and uh, we've had a general election very recently and oh my goodness the standard of debate, the standard of rhetoric was just shamefully in embarrassingly abysmal. Um, for instance, just before the Brexit vote, um, it was the last pamphlet I got through my door. I got this. Don't let Farage speak for you. That was it. That was it. This was the this was their last. What pretty much? I think I, that was the only one I got from the Remain campaign through my door, and it was just a couple of days, and that's it. So they've got one last appeal to me to get me to vote the way they want me to vote. So what do they say? Don't let Farage speak for you. That's it. it, it I, 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 this is drivel, absolute drivel. For a start, he doesn't speak for me. Um, Farage wasn't actually a candidate. There were no candidates. Farage was not going to be elected for any office, wasn't going to be given any power from this referendum. It wasn't about electing anyone as an MP or anything of the kind. It was just, do you want to stay in the EU or don't you? It had nothing whatsoever to do with Farage. And and what does it say that's so bad about Nigel Farage? Nothing. We just got a picture of him looking a bit weird. So this is a, an, an appeal to to my, I suppose, fear of not being cool. Oh no, if I vote the wrong way, I'll be associated with a group of people who have voted the wrong way. And of course, uh, some part of that uh, involves another set which overlaps with it uh, of people who voted for Nigel Farage in another election. And that's bad because he's a bit funny looking. That's it. Don't let narrow Nigel Farage speak for you. That's all it said. Dismal, come on. That was your big chance to persuade me and remain campaign. You blew it with your dismally bad rhetoric. Um, in the uh, election uh, that's, that's just happened, uh, I got another uh, leaflet through my door. I'm not going to show you it straight away because I don't want you. I don't want you to know which party this candidate uh, was uh, uh, standing for. Um, and he has three bam, bam, bam policies. You know, this is what he stands for. This is why you should vote for this guy. OK, so this is his one big chance. I didn't know this guy. I, I, he, this is, my only knowledge of this guy comes from this pamphlet through my door. So what does he say? Championing Newcastle as a great place to live, work and do business, creating more jobs for the people of our city. Working hard to deliver good quality and cost effective public services for everyone in Newcastle fighting for Newcastle in Parliament to make sure we get the best deal from government for investment in our communities. So which party does he represent? Could be any of them, couldn't it? Because even though some people might say, oh, that sounds good, I agree with all that, it's utterly empty rhetoric because nobody is saying the opposite of this. 
working hard to deliver good quality and cost-effective public services for everyone in Newcastle. Really? Is there some party somewhere that's deciding not to do any work at all about public services and uh, we want bad quality services that are not cost-effective and only for some people in Newcastle? Um, is anybody saying that? Of course not. They're, they're not completely insane. So nobody is saying the opposite of these things and yet it seems that some people felt that this was saying something. It's saying nothing. And if you um, are a little bit more alert to, uh, to, to rhetoric, perhaps you will see through this drivel more readily. Um, uh, Obama, um, what did, the audacity of hope, and yes, we can. And I remember seeing a speech where he said, I believe it's time to move forward. And he got a round of applause for that. What does it mean? Is anybody saying, actually, right now, I think it's time for a retrograde step? Was anyone saying that? Of course they weren't. If nobody's saying the opposite of something, then statements like that are just rhetorical drivel. Uh, Tony Blair managed to get uh, become leader of his party and then elected as uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, despite never having admitted to any opinion on anything. When a reporter tried to pin him down on, you must have some belief in something, he said, I believe in the family. What does that mean? I mean, I was in a family when I was a child, so I believe in them, but even if I'd been brought up as an orphan, I imagine that there are families out there. What does that tell, tell us about his policy on um, you know, child support payments or anything like that? It tells us nothing. I believe in the family, utterly empty rhetoric. It's, um, it's bad sophistry. Uh, that, that's, that's a level of sophistry that even the worst of sophists would be ashamed of, frankly. Um, so what I suggest is that we bring back rhetoric to our schools, uh, that it gets parceled out amongst the various, uh, various um, uh, subjects, so it immunizes us against all the drivel, so that we don't get the embarrassment of things like if only a maths teacher had, had immunised some of the, the politicians representing us in the modern mother of parliaments, uh, we wouldn't have had the embarrassment of li listening to people complaining that it was absolutely outrageous that, as they'd read in a, a, a report on, on death rates in British hospitals, that some hospitals have got above average death rates. Well, of course they have. Of course they've got above average death rates. Something must be done, you must listen to me, they were saying, standing up in parliament. That's what an average is. It doesn't matter how great all your hospitals are. Even if every hospital in Britain were better than every hospital outside Britain, still about half of them would have above average death rates because that's how averages work. But they clearly didn't understand this and they weren't just laughed off the stage immediately. They stood up to, to, to say this uh, because perhaps the standard of uh, education in rhetoric just, you know, isn't what it should be. So we would be immunised against all the drivel. Why don't, we, why don't we teach kids about ad hominem attacks? Why don't we teach them about straw man attacks and cherry picking and false dilemmas and so forth? All these bad arguments that you see again and again and again coming up in, in arguments on Twitter and on Facebook and in the comments on YouTube. Sorry, my comments are great, by the way. I just like to say and, and thank my viewers that the, the standard of comments below my videos it's really actually pretty pleasing um, but sometimes you see obvious straw man obvious false dilemma a false dilemma just a couple of examples that's when you're saying well if you don't choose that then you're going to get that you've got to choose between that and that and that's all there is but actually sometimes no there are other possibilities but you can present something as a false dilemma a full, uh, false dichotomy and that's a, you know, a common bad bit of rhetoric. And if you spot it for what it is, you're immunised against it and you can do something about it. You can defend yourselves and you can all be better people. Bring back rhetoric.